The next thing is, of course, I talk about is international trade and the role of the government in international trade. First of all, like every single government of the world, in fact, they promote their own exports. They want their businesses to export more. And that's what like, uh, uh, we have done in this particular course of international business that every single student is going to write an export business plan. The first theory in this regard uh, is called theory of mercantilism. And under, under that particular theory, in fact, uh, it, it is widely understood that the countries, they have to export more than, than import. So that means that the country's accounts receivable has to be more than the country's accounts payable, which really create a positive balance of uh, payments or the balance of trade as well. And of course, like the second theory uh, in the theory of absolute advantage. When we talk about the theory of absolute advantage, that really under that particular theory, some countries have an absolute advantage on certain product. For example, the US has an absolute advantage on agricultural product. Or we can compare, like we can say the comparative analysis that the US has an absolute advantage on agricultural product than any country in Asia or any country, for example, in, in, in Africa. On the other side, we can give another good example is we can say that Ghana has an absolute advantage in the production of cocoa than North Korea or South Korea. Uh, so that means that the yes, Ghana because of its location, because of uh, its uh, topography, uh, produces more cocoa than Korea. So that is what the theory of absolute advantage is. Then we move into another area which is called the theory of comparative advantage. Under that particular theory of comparative advantage, I would recommend, in fact, uh, like uh, to all my students to understand that this is the theory where, uh, like, a country may have a capability or capacity of manufacturing a product, but they will not manufacture that particular product because they may not have a comparative advantage. For example, what happened to the U.S. economy in the last few years is that the textile and the electronic industry, it has gone out of United States into Asia. It means that the U.S. still had uh, like the capability and the capacity of manufacturing any electronics or manufacturing any uh, textile products. But the reason that like these products, they have gone, for example, into China that today the China or the Korea or Pakistan or India or, or any other country, they are manufacturing all these electronics uh, and textile products are because of their comparative advantage. Manufacturing, for example, a cotton shirt is more expensive in the United States than manufacturing the same cotton shirt in China. Under that theory, in fact, like it provides, uh, under that theory, in fact, like it provides uh, uh, it gives more comfort to the U.S. buyers and, uh, and it really helps the U.S. economy in a way under this theory of comparative advantage that uh, a, a, an American consumer can save more money by spending less on these basic human needs products, electronics and clothing. So ultimately, it then in the long run it really helps the U.S. economy also because then the people, they will be saving more money and they will be putting that more savings into the banks which will help the fiscal and monetary policies uh, as a whole. The next topic uh, uh, we cover in this area is uh, the trade policy of the government. And when we talk about the trade policies of the government, trade policies of the government means that like the governments who control uh, the taxes, the tariffs, duties, quotas, administrative uh, policies and uh, of course like dumping, anti-dumping policies and, and some of course like the government incentives on international trade as well. Uh, all these uh, things which are in the control of the government. The governments have in fact the powers, the governments Every government of the world, they have a power that they can impose any kind of taxes or tariff 
on the goods which are imported into the country to protect the local industry. And at the same time, uh, uh, like for example, the U.S. government it provides uh, an excellent incentives on on uh, in, uh, exporting agricultural product or exporting any American manufactured industrial products as well. Uh, for example, when you are going to look into exim.gov or usda.gov, then you will realize is that uh, the U.S. government spent billions of dollars on export financing guarantees money where 85 percent of the sale is guaranteed by the by the u.s government's bank which is uh, called export import bank of the united states or on the commodity side or on the agricultural products or on grains uh, approximately billions more than more than five billion dollars is provided in guarantees uh, uh, to the foreign buyers uh, to the foreign buyers and the coverage in, in, in USDA guarantees are up to 98%. So these are the best incentives uh, you, will, you will find out when you visit all these websites. The next area we cover is, uh, and that is the foreign direct investments. The foreign direct investments, in fact, uh, uh, are attracted by every single government. The US, the US uh, economy and the US government, they are in a very good situation because of the political stability and because of the availability of uh, every single facility and because of extremely developed infrastructure that America attracts lots of investments. But at the same time, there are many countries of the world who also gives incentives to the foreign investors that they should come and they should invest into those countries. Of course, when we talk about uh, the foreign direct investment point of view, then we got to understand a terminology called like the home country and the host country. Uh, when and let me give you an example in this in this area. When GM General Motors, which is an American company, when General Motors decides to go and invest in China and set up a auto manufacturing plant in China, then in that situation, in fact, American uh, like American company or America then considered as a as a home country because the GM's home is the United States and the Chinese uh, people of the Chinese government and the country of China it is considered as a host country. So in case of foreign direct investments there are uh, benefits in fact to both. In the beginning of course more jobs are created so the host country uh, benefits out of that and people they pay taxes so the revenues of the host country they increase. But in the long run then what happened is uh, profits are repatriated back to the home country. Then home country benefits because the foreign exchange is coming back to the, to the home country. And at the same time, uh, not only the foreign exchange, but the home country's parent company, which is in this particular example, which I give, give you as, as a GM, uh, GM then becomes more and more stronger. At the same way, you will realize is that like, uh, yeah, America has attracted many, many investments uh, and one, one good example I always quote is an auto industry. You will find out that every single European automobile manufacturer and every single Japanese automobile manufacturers, they have, uh, they have their foreign direct investments into the United States and, uh, and, and, and they, are, they are manufacturing their own respective, respective automobiles. Of course, like the foreign direct investment, as I told you in the beginning, this is the last stage of international business. Last stage doesn't mean that there is no more after that, but this is the most experienced stage. Uh, I would just like to re-emphasize again, the first stage is of course uh, developing an exports from, from a company or uh, from a particular country, then, then establishing sales offices in different countries, wherever the company or the country they are exporting. The third area is, of course, uh, uh, establishing a joint venture. And within that, like uh, joint venture and establishing a sales office, there are a couple of more things which fall into. One is called uh, franchising, like uh, McDonald's is the best example, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They have franchised their operations worldwide. And then, of course, like the last stage is uh, uh, establishing a manufacturing facility or a production facility which is called uh, Greenfield Investments or Foreign Direct Investments. The last, uh, the last uh, topic 
uh, in this particular section is about uh, regional economic integration. And when we talk about the regional economic integration, then uh, let me tell you from the American perspective first. For example, NAFTA is the best example. NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. North African Free Trade Agreement signed in early 90s between Mexico, US and Canada. And the basic purpose of this agreement was elimination of most of the duties and the free flow of goods and services across the borders. It has benefited US, it has benefited Canada, it has benefited Mexico as well. But what happens is when we talk about the regional economic integration, that means that the countries of a given region, they join hand together to establish economic relationship in such a way that each and every country be benefited. And it has certain level of course, like the first level in this, uh, in this area is uh, like a free trade area, custom union, common market, economic union and political union. Uh, if, you, if you realize these five, six elements in fact, uh, uh, Europe is the only continent which has achieved uh, all these things. It started with the European economic community and then what happened is that after that the European economic community they went into EU, European Union and today in fact more than 32 countries are part of uh, this uh, European uh, Union part of and, and it has achieved so much seniority that uh, not only the tariffs and the taxes has been eliminated and there is a free flow of goods and services. For example, if you want to sell into Europe, you just need to enter at any one point in Europe. You can enter from France, you can enter from, you can enter from France, you can enter from Holland, England, and then it's a free flow of goods, whole entire Europe. It has also created a European Parliament, and those European Parliament, they have uh, their uh, office uh, in Brussels. And there are some rules and regulations which, uh, which have been enacted uh, to implement and effectively follow like the guidelines of European Union. At the same time, uh, they have addressed the issue of currency as well by, by establishing Euro. Then of course, there are some uh, like economic, regional economic integration within Africa. ECOWAS is one of the good examples and we are going to read into this particular chapter as well. And then there are some, uh, uh, not very much has done in Asia, but of course ASEAN is, uh, is one of the area uh, which, uh, like, which has plays its effective role. But in Asia you will realize is that China itself is an uh, independent economy, so does the India. And then there are some surrounding countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all these countries in Asia as well. But, but in Asia when we go uh, like uh, further, uh, up north, then you will realize is that next to China is Japan, Korea, and when we when we go further down south, then Indonesia, Malaysia, all these countries, in fact, they are playing a very important and vital role by using that economic, uh, regional economic integration. Africa, uh, ECOWAS has all, is also part of Africa, which is which is the Western Africa. And within them, when you come to South and Central America, then you will realize is that CAFTA is a Central American Free Trade Agreement. All these factors, in fact, have been beneficial in the development of international business under that, uh, under that economic uh, integration. And with that, in fact, in the end, I would say, after the end of Second World War, uh, like two major financial institutions were created, the World Bank and the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And what I'm going to do is that I will talk uh, about these two institutions uh, in, my, in my next session. So I hope that like this particular lecture will develop a in-depth understanding of international business. And in my second series, of course, then we are going to cover some more topics. Uh, Thank you very much and till then, goodbye.